All right, three, two, one, we are recording. Hello and welcome to the Ivanti Entrepreneur Podcast. I am Dave Mamano, your host. And what I do with Avanti Entrepreneur Podcast, just the Avanti Entrepreneur Network in general, is I find great entrepreneurs and I dig into their brains and I get all the great nuggets and I share it with the Avanti family so that they can grow and learn and move forward in their business. Now, today I have a really special guest on the show. Now, now please note, she is an entrepreneur. She actually won Small Business Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 1987 in Rochester, New York. So that's pretty cool. But we're not talking about her today. We're talking about the book that she wrote. And so what am I talking about? Holy cow. So first of all, first and foremost, I want to welcome uh, Jane Plitt. Jane, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. So happy to have you. So we're, 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 we're talking about an entrepreneur that in my mind should be as well known as Henry Ford, right? and George Eastman, et cetera. Um, and, and her name is Martha Matilda Harper. And you're gonna, you, you, you really have dedicated a large part of your life lately to not only writing books about Martha, but also um, really just getting out there, doing presentations, and, and one by one, group by group, um, kind of enlightening people about who this incredible woman was. So we're, we're going to learn more about Martha Matilda Harper. And in my mind, complete total rock star. I'm reading your book right now. I'm about halfway through it. And I'm just blown away. So we're going to learn more about her. But first, I'm going to formally introduce you. You sent me your bio. And I'm going to, I'm going to read a good part of it. And we're going, to, we're going to learn more about you and Martha Matilda Harper. So Jane Plitt, who is, who is the guest on the show today, she ran a thriving business consulting practice until she became enthralled with Martha Matilda Harper's story. In 1996, she was appointed a visiting scholar at the University of Rochester to pursue her research. The result was a book entitled Martha Matilda Harper and the American Dream, How One Woman Changed the Face of Modern Business. It was released in May, 2000, uh, in May of 2000 by Syracuse University Press. And as a result of Plitz efforts, Harper was in, inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame, along with the American Business Hall of Fame. Well-deserved. In 2017, Plitt released a young children's book entitled Martha's Magical Hair, published by Jade Publishing. And in 2018, uh, Jane co-wrote a young adult version of the Harper story called Martha and the Hairpreneur, with Sally Valentine. In 2019, a paperback version of the Harper biography was released. Now, Jane, like I said, in 1987, was selected as Rochester Small Business Person of the Year, and she also has served in the areas uh, as the area's 1986 delegate to the White House Conference on Small Business. How cool is that? That same year, she was chosen by Savvy Magazine as one of 14 outstanding women in New York State, and in 1993, she was designated the area's small business advocate by the U.S. Business Administration. This bio goes on so many, so many great things, Jane. Congratulations on all, all your success. And, you know, certainly an outstanding, you and Martha, uh, outstanding business women, but even take, take the word women out of there, just outstanding, you know, business people, right? I mean, like, um, and, and doing incredible things. And, and that's, that's what we're gonna talk about, Martha Matilda Harper. You've written this, these books about her. Now, Martha, and this is the first guest that I've ever done a show on who is not with us anymore. <laughs> Martha, at the, uh, I believe at the age of 93, passed away in 1950. And there was a little celebration about her accomplishments. And then she kind of faded into thin air, right? And, uh, and, and you know, as we joke, and maybe it's because history is uh, – written by white men, right? And, and so we're gonna dig into Martha. And Martha, I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, people are like, who is this Martha, David? Tell me about her. Well, we're gonna learn a lot of details about her story, but I just wanna tell everybody, first and foremost, what she is credited for and what makes her so amazing. So Martha Matilda Harper, I think about, think about starting a, not only like just starting a business as a woman in the 1880s, right? They couldn't even vote if they were married. Uh, they, they essentially had no rights, right? I mean, you know, uh, the, 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 the husband, he was the one that counted and the, the wife and kids were kind of, you know, you know, 
included in the in the unit, right? But uh, so it was a very different time, right? Very different time. Um, a time when Susan B. Anthony was was you know was was starting to really make some uh, some dents. Uh, in the women's rights universe, et cetera. Rochester was a very happening place back back then with with all these uh, these suffrage rights and and we you know in addition to we we had uh, uh, Frederick Douglass here as well. So it's a really real hotbed, right? So Martha moved here, started a uh, a hair salon with some hair tonics, and so what what she ended up doing is amazing. She is credited for starting the first retail franchise. And I think that is so incredible. Um, and 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 you know, and then she, I think it was over 500 franchisees at its peak around the world, right? Um, he had schools and everything going on, and 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 she was going against a current that was so strong. It would have been hard to do what she did if you were a white man in the 1880s. And and here is a woman with with essentially who couldn't vote and, and just had to convince a lot of white men to give her a shot. <laughs> right. And she did, and she pursued and, and, uh, and, and really made some great things happen. So Jane, I have been talking way too much. I, I, I want to hear more about you. You were in, you now you live in Florida now, but you spent a lot of time in Rochester. Um, you were here in Rochester giving a, a, a great presentation to the Avanti members. And then also at the Rochester Museum and Science Center, um, to a lot of people that wanted to learn more about Martha and, and get a copy of your uh, updated new book. But, you know, give us, give us the story. Give us the scoop and the path. Who is Martha Matilda Harper? And, and how did she end up coming to Rochester to really make a difference and, and make, as Steve Jobs would say, truly make a dent in the universe? Well, uh, thank you for this opportunity. And hello, all Avanti listeners. Martha was a servant girl from the time she's seven in uh, Ontario, Canada. And as you suggested, life is pretty gloomy for poor women, for most women, but especially poor women. She does have the opportunity to come to the United States and fortunately to Rochester, where with the uh, formula for the hair tonic that she had been um, gifted by her last dying Canadian employer. She comes here, remains a servant, but is very observant. Mm -hmm. And as we know, with um, location, 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 she figures out that the Powers Building is the place to start what was for Rochester the very first beauty salon here in the community. So that's radical enough. Um, she does get in through the help of uh, former Congressman John Van Voris. And now she has this new concept and it is hot. She's got a reclining shampoo chair that prevents um, soap from getting into the eyes of her customers. So they're buzzing about it. They're talking. And she begins to capitalize, we see, on basic business savvy and lessons. So you capitalize on your assets. She capitalized on her long hair. It was floor length. She capitalized on this unique hair tonic. She capitalizes on a new invention that she creates, the reclining shampoo chair. And people are so excited about it that they bring out of town customers um, and visitors. And people like Bertha Palmer arrive out of Chicago. And Bertha is scheduled to be the head of the women's exposition in 1893 in Chicago. And Bertha wants the Harper shop. That propels Martha to figure out a way in which she can expand. And as you suggested, she does come up with this concept of a strong headquarters, um, mm. clear directions and training, and then satellite operations. She did, in fact, expand, and there was a Harper shop in 1893 for the World's Fair, and Bertha was very happy. But then others of the 
society ladies clamored for theirs and shops began to expand in Washington, D.C. Grace Coolidge, the first lady, delights in it and she brings her friends mm -hmm. and in New York City and in California. And so it begins to spread and then it spreads across the ocean and um, really circled the world. Mm -hmm. What was remarkable about Harper was having been poor for 25 years, having recognized the systemic limitations that women were facing, she realized with the help of the suffragists and Susan B. Anthony, who was her customer, that they could um, economically empower women with business. Whoopee. So the um, concept that Martha came up with was really also another pioneering idea, and that was to create social entrepreneurship, whereby the first hundred of her 500 shops only went to poor women. And when you start seeing the photographs of these young women as servants versus as now franchisors, you begin to see confidence, you begin to see pride and capability. Meanwhile, Harper is continuing to oversee this operation, but she has created loyalty among her basic um, esprit de corps, among the Harper workers who are often called Harperites and Harper owners, so that anybody could go into any shop anywhere in the world and they would basically be assured of the same approach, the same techniques, and the same products. Um, in addition, if I can just add. Please, please. She goes on to incorporate only organic products. So not only is she creating a whole new way of doing business and bringing along poor women, she is simultaneously saying, I can put my belief system into products. And she did not believe in chemicals. She thought they were dangerous. And so all of her products were organic. And significantly, at the turn of the century, hair dyes became quite popular and were a business um, revenue agent. She rejected them and she would not provide them in any of her shops because she believed they were dangerous. So there she is, cutting edge and also advocating um, what sounds like contemporary beliefs in organic products. So, so many trailblazing moves in, in everything that you just said, right? right? So, you know, for those people, uh, you know, most of our Avanti listeners are, are not in Rochester. You mentioned the Powers Building. So the Powers Building in the 1880s, you know, kind of was our version of the Empire State Building in New York City, right? It was like the coolest, tallest, most beautiful building around in Rochester. And Rochester was a boomtown back then, right? I mean, every, we were the fastest growing city in the country. So many great things going on. George Eastman uh, from Kodak started Kodak the same year that Martha started her company, right? Which is pretty that cool. That is correct. However, I love to point out that Eastman started with $1 million worth of venture capital in 1888. And Harper in 1888 launches her concept with $360, which was a <laughs> lifelong savings. Right. So we had inequity <laughs> even then. Um, even in then, with, absolutely. Yes. Well, and, and, you know, I'm reading the book and, you know, so back in the day, was it not only hard for a, a woman to rent a store, but, you know, the, the, back then it's hard to picture today, but, you know, salons were kind of unsavory places to go back in the day, right? Hair salons, et cetera. Um, kind of, we'll say the unsavory women would hang out there. Is that correct? Um, actually, they didn't exist. Okay. So in Rochester, it was highly unusual in the Victorian era um, to have beauty salons for women. You were supposed to take care of it um, in the secrecy of your house. Mm. Um, so that was another revolutionary step. There were some beauty salons and African-American women had some, 
but not many. Yeah. And um, you're right. The assumption was if you went to such a, a shop, theoretically, then probably you were a hussy or a prostitute, right? right? Yeah. So fancy ladies didn't want that. So Martha needed a way to lure them. And she needed um, also her employees to be trained in such a way that they would make those customers feel like they were number one, which he did. There was never to be gossip. And um, there was privacy and there was an elegance in how customers were treated. Men yeah. eventually were able to also enjoy the Harper shops. And um, I love pointing out that at the end of World War I, when President Wilson was negotiating the Treaty of Versailles, he went to a Paris Harper shop for a relaxing um, scalp massage. I love that. I love that. That is so Don't cool. You? Yeah. And uh, well, you know, in reading the book, you know, you talk about how, you know, Mr. Powers from the Powers Building said, no, you, you can't have a shop uh, because I don't want I don't want this type of, of place in the Powers Building where, you know, a classy place. We're not going to have this quote unquote beauty salon. And uh, but then she went to somebody else that knew Powers and, and he convinced him to give her give her a shot. Uh, and he did it on a, uh, I'll give you a, a month, month by month lease. Right. And, That's right. Yeah. And, uh, and and then, you know, she got so popular, he wanted to lock her down in a long term lease. And she said, no. We'll continue the month by month, right? <laughs> Don't you love it? She had such spirit. She Little really sass. did. She I love did. it. I she love did. it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yep. So, so I mean, I so I think just being able to open up a a, a business model that really didn't exist for the most part. Um, once again, being a woman in a in a in a man's world, convincing you know some some people to be able to to open up this shop, and then just being really a brilliant marketer, right? And and knowing what it was going to take to, to get uh, the flywheel turning. Right. And, and that, that really was getting some, some really, you know, high class women to, to, to visit the shop and then start, start talking and referrals. Right. And then, you know, she got a great reputation. Um, and, uh, and that's when people started saying, Hey, can I, can I have a shop as well? Right. So. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. She, she had a sixth sense for locations. Um, which as entrepreneurs, um, depending on our kind of business, can be critical if it's a retail operation. Um, but she also had an amazing sense of generating enthusiasm, even among her Harperites. So in a time when you don't have computers, when you don't have technology in order to oversee operations, she needed to be able to trust her people. And she selected carefully, but she also created such a loyal base. When she's transforming these people's lives, they will walk over the mountain for her and do just what she says because they've changed, um, she changed their world. And that was also a brilliant element because sometimes when we talk about business, we talk about customers, but if we are operating with employees and the like, we need a team and we need to keep that team uh, motivated and excited. And she was smart enough to every year bring those team members back to her headquarters for updates, but also for celebration. She believed in celebrating achievements, and um, we don't always do enough of that. Well, you know, so so many forward-thinking ideas and strategies that she implemented, right? Um, I mean, bringing everybody together, almost like a Harper pep rally, right? That just of course, made everybody more engaged, made everybody more uh, ambassadors of, uh, with, with everything, right? Um, and, and, you know, you talked about going organic, which is a big movement today. Look at her, right, in the 1880s. Organic, right? I mean, so many innovative things, uh, inventing that chair. Like, she doesn't get credit for inventing the, the chair, right, that, that reclined with the, the, little, the little neck indention so people can... Uh, actually be comfortable 
when they're getting their, their hair uh, washed, you know, before uh, getting it cut. And I asked you at your presentation if she ended up getting that patented and she, she didn't. So, but she probably just was like, this is, this is a great invention that everybody should have. Right. So. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No. And you know, it is one of those opportunities for improvement. Had yeah. she to do it over for sure, she should have patented it. Yeah. But um, she didn't. Um, but she did a lot of other great things. Well, I mean, the marketing, um, the, the, obviously coming up with a franchising concept, once again, invented the, 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 the retail franchising system. Yeah, I mean, amazing, right? Uh, but, but also just, you could tell like, you just love her more and more when, when you read about her and, and you, you mentioned this, that you know, she wouldn't just sell the franchise to anybody, right? She, in the beginning especially, would, would you know, give the franchise to poor women and do a revenue share uh, as far as, as a way to get them out of poverty, right? Give them self-respect, give them confidence. Um, so amazing that she had all of these incredibly innovative concepts, right? And uh, she must be so happy up in heaven, like thanking Jane Plitt for literally digging up this story and bringing it back to life um, and putting her in the Business Hall of Fame where she, where she belongs, right? Uh, so many, so many inventions, so many in innovations. Um, and, uh, and, and I, you know, we talked about that at the height, she had over 500 franchises. And then at age 93 in 1950, when she passed away, you know, she, she actually did get some accolades, right? You know, they, I think she was in the New York Times, her obituary, so it, was a, it was a very glowing obituary, right? Gave her some good credit. It and did. for a while there, for a while there, you know, it was like, you know, it, it, it was worthy of what it should have been. But then it just seemed like it went off a cliff and died, right? So, Unfortunately, even yeah. though the Harper method continued um, until the 1970s uh, when it was bought out by a competitor. But indicative of how loyal people were is the fact that when it was bought out, um, a woman and her husband went into a dumpster for three nights in a row and pulled out all of her artifacts, the prototypes of the Harper uh, reclining shampoo chair, photographs, and fortunately saved it and saved them and moved. So when we think about Harper and while um, you suggest that Martha should be um, feeling blessed that I came along. I feel blessed that now we know about Martha because she represents such an icon of achievement, whether you are male or female, whether you are an immigrant or not. The very fact that she could and did succeed mm -hmm. is so inspiring to anyone and especially those of us, and we know what it's like when you are an entrepreneur and you are dealing with cash flow and challenges and things don't always go quite right. To me, Martha is right there reminding us that there is no reason to give up because had Martha given up, she might never have even launched this brilliant uh, business concept. And we can learn such important lessons from Martha that I continue to think she is a beacon for business success and for opportunities um, that all of us can seize. Because if we think about what is possible by what are capitalizing on our assets again, what do we know really well or what do we feel passionately? And we see that in her story. Um, we see how she capitalized on hair, but she also capitalized on having been a servant and know how to please people. And then that invention wasn't probably sophisticated, but it worked. It was good enough and it got her going forward. So, um, you know, hooray for Martha, and I hope all of your listeners now are going to become Martha Matilda Harper fans. We'll, and be, we'll be Harperite, Harperites in our own right, right? Modern absolutely. day Harperites. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, you know, I was going to say, I'm, I'm hearing your, your, your talk, and 
I, I you know, there's, I think there, you know, who, there's always been a lot of controversy in, in America. Who's ever been president, there's always been people who complained about, you know, when he, you know, you're the leader of the free world, but, you know, usually at least 50% of your own country doesn't even like you, right? So there's always been problems, always been complaints about America, uh, especially today, right? Uh, you know, a lot of complaints about injustices, et cetera. And, and you know, a lot of those are valid, right? They need to be worked on and fixed and explored and acknowledged. Uh, but if I'm going to say something great, you know, like God bless America and the fact that it was a country, even back then with all the difficulties she had, she was still able to do it, right? She was still able to make it happen. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly easier today, um, and there's still some roadblocks and some inequities, but at the same time in America, you still can get past all that and make it happen, right? As a man, of course, but as a woman, as a minority, um, it, it still is a country with the right focus and the right determination. Um, and, and once again, like Martha, with, with the right innovations and, and, and the right heart, doing things the right way, um, it still is possible really for anybody in this country to make something happen. And, you know, and she did it in the 1800s, right, when it was a thousand times tougher. And there are countries today in the world where – I'm guessing a woman is not allowed to start a business, right? And uh, and so it, it, it makes me appreciate, despite all the the, the bad news we hear uh, about things going on today, it's still and has been a darn great country. So that, that's what I'm getting from this story as well. Like, despite the difficulties, it still is a place where she was able to succeed. And and was it because of her incredible force? of will and incredible intelligence and perseverance and, 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 and coming from a good place. Absolutely. But she was able to do it here too. So it's such a great story on so many levels, Jane. And I, I'm really, I'm really glad that you wrote the book and that you are, um, you know, really prophesizing all the great things that she's done. Well, thank you. And I would just add that, um, she succeeded because of a number of key individuals, but also the suffrage movement. Mm -hmm. This mobilization, the timing was right. And someone once taught me that luck is opportunity meeting preparation. And the timing really mattered. So the fact that she came to the United States, that this was occurring and women and men were mobilizing for equality, um, also help carry her along. And um, you're right. God bless America and God bless Martha Matilda Harper. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking like how, how incredible would it be to go back in time and quote unquote be a fly on the wall in, her, uh, in Martha's original shop, it, you know, Susan B. Anthony walking in to have her hair done and just being able to listen to that conversation. Would that, would that be amazing or what? <laughs> it would have been. You've got someone who's such a political advocate and someone who is this brilliant economic. And yeah. Anthony used to always say, every woman needs her own pocketbook. So I'm sure that Anthony adored mm. what um, Martha was doing because Anthony envisioned that the suffrage was just a first step, and we know that is, um, which is why so many women are going into entrepreneurship, because it is a way to demonstrate your savvy, your strengths, and the like. So yeah. um, it's a pretty exciting opportunity today in 2019. So there's one more thing that, that I want to bring up that, that uh, we'll say maybe she was the original that did this. So Martha, uh, knowing full well what it meant in that day to get married uh, and would, would lose a lot of rights, would lose a lot of her property, her business, et cetera, just because of the laws back then. So she chose not to get married, right? That's correct. Uh, for a long time, for right. a long time, right? And then we're in you, these are your words, which I love. You called her possibly the original cougar. <laughs> 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 because uh, she married somebody, I believe, 24 years her uh, younger than her, right? 
That's yep. correct. She was 63 and he yeah. was 39. Yep. And um, I just love it. I yeah. just love, love, love the fact that she not only chose um, the time, but she also chose the man. Yeah. She informed him that he was going to be her husband. So, um, yeah. It, and it, it's was, a great it was story. her executive assistant. Is that right? It was. It was. What it a great was. story. I love It's like icing on the cake, you know? Like, <laughs> That's right. He, oh, and were, I'm, a, I'm the original cougar, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, you know, Jane, it's funny. I, I oftentimes I'll ask my guests um, if they could go back in history and meet somebody famous, who would it be? I certainly don't have to ask you that question. Right? <laughs> You're right. I would just like one conversation with Martha. That, yeah. that would be, um, but I got pretty close to her. It took six years to uncover um, mm -hmm. the story crisscrossing the United States and Canada listening, reading letters, even reading letters from her husband um, mm -hmm. and her columns in her newsletters that went out to all of the Harperites. So I, I sense mm -hmm. um, I um, have her uh, values and the like, but I would just like a fun conversation to say, so how does how do you feel, Martha, about what you achieved? Yeah, yeah, that would I love be it. Interesting to hear. Love it. I'm thinking about her husband. Uh, do you know Do you know what year he died? Because he, he I imagine, he lived into the 70s, maybe the 80s. Is that right? No, he didn't. He um, died about 10 years after she did, um, and um, he too is um, buried next to her, but in her shadow. Um, it's it. All you need to do is just look at the tombstones and you begin to understand who was in whose shadow. Right. Um, but he had served in World War I and was um, a captain and was very proud of that, um, that role. And uh, therefore, he chose to use the free VA tombstone in ground. And, right. Um, I'm also told it was because he was Scottish. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, it seems like a man who... Seems like a, a, a great man who was very, very, very comfortable with his ego and, and had no, no problem playing second fiddle to his wife, right? Um, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, yeah. As you read his story, he grew up in Iowa and really didn't want to be in farming. And so he went on to college and she provided a way for him to apply his intellect. So they were a good partnership. That's awesome. Is important. Yeah, very cool. So Jane Plitt, thank you so much for all the great work that you're doing and for being on the show. I very much appreciate it. If people want to get in touch with you and go to your website, buy the book, et cetera, what, what are the best ways to, to find you and get in touch with you? Sure. The website is Martha Matilda Harper. Um, <clears throat> and the, um, that's dot org, right? Dot, dot org. org. I'm sorry. Yep. And then the email is um, uh, Martha Matilda Harper, 1888 at gmail.com. And I'd love to hear from people. I am on Twitter at Plitist. So um, tweet me. Um, they can go on Facebook. And Martha Matilda Harper is also publicly posted. And wouldn't it be grand if we can celebrate in a few years her 200th um, anniversary of operation? That would be lovely. Absolutely. That would be fantastic. And everybody, Avanti family, buy the book. This book is amazing. It's a, it's a very well-told story. It's very captivating and engaging. Wrote a great book, Jane. I, I, I really love it. And you, you truly bring her to life. I feel like I'm there with her. So it's a great book, everybody. Please buy it. Uh, is it the best way to buy it at Amazon.com or go yeah. to your site? Yeah, Amazon. Either, or, or the website, either. Just Excellent. enjoy. Excellent. Jane, thank you very much. Once again, I appreciate your time. And Avanti listeners and viewers, appreciate your time and you uh, taking the time really to, to listen and learn and grow with us. We have tons more resources, everybody, at AvantiEntrepreneur.com. All my previous podcasts are there. Incredible coaching resources, uh, info about our event coming up in October. Uh, so many incredible things. AvantiEntrepreneur.com. Come check us out. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everybody. Again, make sure to have a great day and stay awesome.